is we're seeing a much earlier ramp in the cycle than we've seen in the past, which is very interesting. Yeah, you know, it's very rare to be this strong this early in the cycle. Now we are front running some of the capital flows, and so there's probably some correction that happens by the rumor sell the fact. But I think if the space continues like this and we start getting monetary easing and the other conditions that tend to jumpstart the business cycle again, um, then we should see a very strong 2024 and most likely a strong 2025. The business cycles have been almost like clockwork, two-year up cycles, one year peaking, one year down. And that corresponds. What's amazing is the Bitcoin halving cycle is the same as the debt refi cycle, which is, I think, what drives everything. It's the same as the election cycle. They're all the same thing. So, you know, if that continues to repeat, then it should go until 2026 when that should be a bear market year. But, you know, let's see. So I am obviously very bullish. Um, I don't know. And I, I was talking to Nova about this yesterday. I've got three outcomes in my head that I'm juggling with. The 60% probability is we have kind of a very traditional cycle and that pushes, you know, Bitcoin up to the 100,000 to 200,000 range and, you know, all the other assets accordingly where they are on the risk curve. There's a 20% chance this early start is signifying something much bigger, which is the, the larger adoption and the more capital into the space, which leads to larger price rises than people expect because people are quite scarred because the last cycle seemed shorter than most people expected. Everyone thought there was another final leg higher and that never really happened. The kind of 100,000 Bitcoin, the laser eyes idea never got there. But maybe this time the shock is for excess returns beyond expectations. The other side that I, that I grapple with as well is, well, maybe the whole cycle's front loaded. And in fact, it's shorter, but more violence in 2024. So those are the three scenarios that I'm I'm juggling in my head with, but 60% probability is just, it just does what it says on the tin and repeats what it usually does. So Ethereum is broad, deep, and has no career risk in building on it. So it's, you know, it's, it's the established, it's the establishment. It's like, if you want to build in this space, that's the easiest place to go. The, the, the density of talent, the, uh, the density of applications, the density of knowledge is immense. So how can you not be bullish on that, right? That's always going to attract people. It's always going to create a rich and vibrant ecosystem. Solana is kind of the new kid on the blog, but you know, they have managed to solve one of the problems that ETH was struggling with, which was speed and cost. So two of those, um, they've managed to solve without compromising security. So, okay, that's interesting. So that's why we've seen a lot of people start building on Solana. And we've seen a very, very vibrant ecosystem being built. And so ETH had to solve that with layer twos, essentially. Well, it doesn't have to happen in Solana. But there's two big system developments in Solana that that really means that it has to play catch up in value terms, I think. Uh, doesn't mean it has to be the same size as ETH or bigger than ETH. None of those, it's just, you know, the, the rate of change of, of um, value accrual comes quite quickly. One is the compressed NFTs I talked about before. That's a, nobody's got their head around this yet. People are thinking, oh, I can just print a thousand, a million monkey JPEGs. You know, it's it's not about that. It's what else can you use a smart contract for? That's really interesting. Secondly, it's Fire Dancer, which most people aren't aware of yet. But Fire Dancer is the validator built by Jump Trading that essentially rebuilds Solana in a different language from the ground up. What they've done is double the security by having these two validators on the network. And in testing, it's had a million TPS. So this is of an order of magnitude different. Why does a million TPS matter? Because Solana's pretty fast as it is. It's because it matters and why it's being built by jump trading is high frequency traders use fiber optic cables and, and their constraint is the speed of light. And they're like, well, if we want exchanges to go decentralized and be able to cope with the traditional financial markets, you're going to need to get to this speed. That's what this is about. And that opens up a whole bunch of use cases. So I see the vibrancy of 
the Solana developer network. I also think the UX of Solana overall is just nicer. It's just an easier place to hang out. And so, you know, the, the applications built on Solana just seem just a little bit easier. And so the the comparison, Chris Berniski talks about this as well, it's like Android versus Apple. It's like Solana feels like Apple. It's a closed system, but it's very slick, very good. Will create great loyalty. Ethereum is much broader, much more open in terms of other things that can be built on top of it. It's too early to tell. I mean, I, I would remain that ETH remains dominant because, you know, there is always innovation going on in ETH. It's not like it's a dead chain. So I just assume that the amount of smart people in the entire ETH ecosystem will bring breakthrough after breakthrough. But I just think there's a big catch up in valuation terms of, of the Solana network versus ETH network. You know, should it be a multi hundred billion dollar ecosystem? Could it be? Probably. Could ETH be a trillion dollar plus ecosystem? For sure. I'm not sure that the pecking order changes. Well, I'm still a bit partial to the ETH flips Bitcoin uh, pecking order because of the uh, because of the number of use cases and uh, network activity measured in different ways. But who knows? Doesn't really matter. Yep. Yeah, so my crypto markets are forward looking. So most people are saying, well, we're probably around a recession. We're seeing unemployment go up. Blah blah blah. Crypto knew about this last year because it's forward looking. It actually trades on liquidity conditions. And I do a lot of macroeconomic research at my research company, Global Macro Investor. And for us, the liquidity cycle just keeps going for the next two years. So we will see a bottoming of the economy, uh, maybe Q1, Q2 of next year, that people will visibly start to see things improving. But the markets are already trading it. The equity market's already almost back at the all-time highs. Crypto market's ripping because they're discounting this. If we live that six months in the future, are the Fed likely to be raising rates or cutting rates? Cutting rates. At worst, they don't do anything. But that's so the probability is for easing of liquidity conditions. You know, is there a chance because we're going to an election year that they stimulate with fiscal stimulus? Pretty much 100% chance they'd like to buy votes. So 2024 is all about stimulus um, and economic recovery. That's a very, very, very good backdrop. And that's the transition from crypto and macro spring into crypto macro summer. And that macro summer, crypto summer, is we're starting to see growth pick up, bottom pick up, but inflation's not picking up yet. It's still falling from the, the lagging effects of the old cycle. So inflation is not a problem. Growth is going up and liquidity is coming into the system. That's like the perfect environment.